校长、秘书长、馆长、各位院长们、主任们、各界专业人士、杰出校友和杰出系友们，大家午安！欢迎各位参加我们这次湛江大学六十六周年的校庆大师演讲系列。那此活动的主办单位呢为湛江大学，承办单位呢为工学院建筑学系。在此呢介绍与会的贵宾。丹江大学校长张嘉怡校长，建筑学系系主任米富国米主任，立法委员吴思瑶委员，最后丹江大学建筑学系杰出系友金鹰奖得主。许圣杰建筑师，谢谢大家的莅临，恭请校长致辞。嗯 ，Professor Coolhouse, Honorable Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of Tankong University, I would like to welcome all of you to attend this speech. Delivered by the famous architect Ram Kohlhaas, and this activity is one of our celebration for Tankang's 66th anniversary. We just celebrate our founding 66th anniversary last weekend, from the Sunday till Monday yesterday. But actually, today, November the 8th. It's the exact day of our founding anniversary. So I think it is really a wonderful time for we can have a speech today. And also I want to express my congratulations to the, our Department of Architecture for sponsoring such an important and uh, uh, timely um, speech. I think uh, also we will really thank you for Professor Ram Kohas can <coughs> spare his time uh, very t during his very tight schedule when he can give us uh, the speech. So it is my great honor to uh, introduce Professor Kohas. <coughs> and Professor Kohas is the uh, Founding partner of OMA in 1975. He's a Dutch architect, architectural theorist, urbanist, and also professor in practice and architecture in, in urban design at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. Who has studied at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London and also at Cornell University in the United States. He is widely regarded as one of the most important architectural thinkers and urbanists of his generation. In year 2014, he was the director of the 14th International Architectural Exhibition of the Venice by now entitled Fundamentals. And now he's also have a project in Taipei, the Taipei Performing Arts Center. With his partner, David Gionalton, with this project, we could experience the dynamic and special public architecture in our city. So today we are very happy to invite Kuhas to give our audience and all our students some important concepts and trends of architectural design, urban development, and culture. So let's welcome Professor Kuha. Um, 
I'm extremely happy to be here uh, because, uh, and, and also uh, I would like to say that I'm very happy to give a lecture here because I've been in Taipei over the past couple of years uh, almost every two months and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to actually communicate. Also, I would like to say uh, that I was announced uh, as an important thinker. Uh, what I hope to kind of present this uh, afternoon is uh, to show that I consider myself uh, as somebody who responds to uh, events and responds to changes uh, in the world, uh, changes in political systems, uh, changes in economic situations. And that therefore, I hope to show that a lot of my so-called thinking is actually uh, a form of permanent adjustment. And I make a point of this because uh, it kind of somehow um, will show my presentation not to be necessarily the work of an exceptional uh, person. I see it more as the work uh, that is generated in an excep exceptional period. Um, and as you will see, and that is, I think, uh, for a young audience, actually quite difficult to imagine because, uh, in a way, uh, when you're young, you assume that the conditions that you're in at a particular moment uh, will be more or less uh, permanent. And I think that our culture today is actually trying to reinforce that notion. But as you will see in my presentation, uh, the past uh, 40 years have been one continuous kind of story of change, almost on a global scale. And what I'm trying to reflect in this particular le lecture is how those changes fundamentally uh, change architecture and change what architecture can do. Anyway, uh, we think of Europe as a kind of affluent uh, and more or less perfect place, but this was the site uh, where I was born. Uh, at the moment I was born, uh, Rotterdam was completely destroyed uh, by the Germans in the beginning of World War II. And at the end of the war, when I was born, it was still uh, not uh, at all uh, kind of reconstructed. So uh, I would, I'm not saying uh, and showing this picture uh, as a victim, uh, but I would say that I've been extremely lucky to experience this event and this condition because uh, it uh, fundamentally informed uh, my architecture, I think. Uh, maybe more than anything else, uh, that I see architecture as a kind of positive um, activity that is able to uh, uh, intervene in difficult circumstances. And also, I think you can maybe understand that from this uh, point of view, I have very little sympathy for architecture as a kind of form of luxury or architecture as a form of consumerism. I think that uh, this particular condition really um, imprinted on me uh, 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 a sense that I need that uh, I was opposed to waste from the very beginning. Anyway, I was very lucky uh, because again, when I was eight, uh, my parents took me to Indonesia, uh, which had just become independent. And so suddenly from one extreme condition, I was taken to another extreme condition in Asia. And because Indonesia was uh, independent and nationalistic for four years, I had to live more or less like an Indonesian. I went to Indonesian schools, I went to Indonesian education. I was an Indonesian Boy Scout. And uh, I therefore uh, experienced from a very early kind of situation what it meant to be a minority uh, and what it meant also to adjust and to adapt to another uh, civilization or another uh, society. Uh, my initial profession was uh, a journalist and I think in many ways my profession still is that of a journalist because I'm obsessed with kind of understanding kind of local situations uh, and uh, I've also uh, maintained uh, a degree of writing uh, as an essential component uh, of my profession. And I think the, there's many reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that if you're an architect, you are never alone, uh, and the work you do is almost ne never your own work. It's always work of a group. 
work of collaboration. In this case, we are working with Artec and Kanatai uh, Bay uh, Office or Taiwanese Office. And only when you write are you alone, and only when you write do you write uh, do you take full kind of responsibility. In '68, I was a journalist in Paris. '68 uh, was a kind of very important, at least on the scale of Europe, year because it meant that in many different countries, Italy, uh, Germany, Holland, and uh, France, uh, the youth, my generation, uh, went uh, into uh, the mode of uh, protests and demonstrations, and in the case of France, almost succeeded in kind of finish, finishing a government. And of course, this kind of protest or this uh, a natu almost natural kind of reflection to question uh, everything has uh, kind of remained sometimes uh, with good effects and sometimes with annoying effects, kind of part of my generation and also part of myself. Anyway, when I was 25, uh, I decided to become an architect, kind of simply on an impulse. I, I cannot really reconstruct exactly why it was, but I met some architects uh, I was a filmmaker uh, at the time, and every architect wanted to be a filmmaker, so I decided to, to want to become an architect. Um, we, I was an architect in London in 68. Um, 68 was the year not only of kind of revolt, but also the year of flower power. Flower power in America, flower power as the kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, counterpart of a kind of more political struggle in Europe. Uh, in the school, you had to always document one piece of architecture as part of your education. Most people documented uh, Greek islands or uh, nice uh, cities uh, on the Mediterranean. Uh, I decided to go uh, to um, Berlin and to document the Berlin Wall. You see here the kind of landscape of Berlin, and you see that here there runs a concrete structure which at the time divided Berlin into parts. In other words, uh, I felt that uh, the architecture of flower power was a little bit too innocent and, and too sweet, and therefore I was interested in looking at the generation of architecture or the creation of architecture, not as a kind of formal art, but as a political uh, necessity. Because it turned out that, uh, as you probably uh, know or may not know, Berlin was divided between a Soviet and uh, Allied uh, sector. And basically, at some point in 68, they, they decided to make the separation uh, a physical separation. And here you see how it started, kind of simply with barbed wire organized in the street, and kind of people could uh, still talk. But very soon, the same kind of line was occupied by soldiers, and then kind of basically the street facades were cemented, and then you had the wall in its uh, definitive form. Here you see how, it kind of, how they broke down the houses, and this is the uh, rest, the free rest, and here the unfree uh, Soviet-influenced uh, East Berlin. And therefore, what I, my fascination was how this was an entirely kind of physical entity. Uh, in a way, nobody would call it architecture, but clearly that kind of separation and that kind of intervention in the city could be read as an architectural uh, event and an architectural strategy. And uh, it became, uh, for my first project or my last diploma project uh, in the AA school, uh, a kind of metaphor, or I adopted it, where kind of running through the center of London, there was uh, a, a special zone uh, that you have to enter uh, with difficulty. Uh, if you were allowed to enter, you could enter, and where life was more sparkling, more communal, more beautiful than in the kind of environment around it. This was a typical kind of project uh, that uh, currently is unthinkable for me, but. Then, when utopianism was uh, in the air, still uh, was not so unusual, not so untypical. And here we had the inhabitants of this architecture singing uh, a song of gratitude to the architecture that enclosed them. 
I, I promised that I gave a lecture, uh, would give a lecture about my entire <laughs> youth and life. Uh, so I'm not just saying that I still kind of support this, but I'm showing the kind of the reality and, and the transformation of one idea uh, into another idea. Um, because, I, because of all this uh, work so far, I was able to go to New York and to um, imagine and to study the architecture of New York. And I had a very uh, political purpose for that. I basically, I th I, I'm really always worried that architecture is a kind of art separate from the people or an elitist uh, activity. And the only city where I could prove architecture was not e elitism, but was a, a more spontaneous uh, form of culture uh, was in New York. Uh, and and uh, because in Europe, uh, we had many avant-garde architects who were trying very hard to make the cities in Europe to conform to their ideas. In Europe, in America, you had the opposite. Somehow, an amazing city emerged uh, almost seemingly without any architects. So I decided to kind of study that kind of New York and, and to begin to try to understand it. This is kind of really the typ uh, typical image of a modern city. And what I think is new about it, and, and which uh, at the time kind of few people would uh, understand, is that any of these buildings is uh, in a fundamental way mystery. Uh, the architecture used to be very clear. It used to be clear that a university looks like a university, a church like a church, a prison like a prison. But in New York or in that kind of uh, contemporary city, every building could be anything. Uh, it's simply enormous uh, volume, and that volume can be used in an infinite number of ways. And therefore, uh, it, uh, it's a fundamentally different kind of city. Because where the city used to make sure that everyone understood what it is about, in New York, that understanding is almost impossible. At the time, I still had the privilege of talking to a number of kind of people that uh, were alive. Uh, this is Wallace Harrison, the architect of uh, United Nations building, and that they were explaining what they did. You know, and that was never theoretical, but it was always interesting. And my main fascination, I was also able to kind of simply look at existing buildings, again, without uh, famous architects or important architects, and try to see how they worked. This one was called the Downtown Athletic Club in the south of Manhattan. And what it is, is a kind of uh, an athletic club, as the name suggests, uh, a series of uh, athletic activities superimposed over a very small uh, plot and then kind of residential uh, component uh, and the two are separated uh, by a restaurant. Uh, so far so normal except that of course uh, it's not that normal to have all these athletic activities kind of superimposed over such a distance. Now if you looked at one of the kind of plans, this was the ninth floor, you see a locker room so that's a dressing area you see a boxing and wrestling area, uh, and you see an oyster bar. So if you kind of co reconstruct the scenario that uh, a, a plan like that describes, it would be eating oysters uh, with uh, boxing gloves uh, naked. And basically my interest uh, was that uh, that kind of imagination had never be part of formal architecture, but nevertheless, uh, in New York it existed and that seemed to me a kind of really new form of considering architecture or considering what architecture could do. Anyway, after the episode of New York I went back uh, to London, became a teacher at the school where I had studied myself, uh, the Architectural Association, and that was a really wonderful kind of situation because this separation between uh, teachers and students was minimal. In other words, you could work uh, quite intimately together and you were working together on subjects kind of rather than trying uh, to transfer the knowledge of the teacher to a student. And basically that situation has been and, and remained very important for me. Uh, I was uh, Zahadid's teacher, so-called, but it was more, uh, I was her partner in developing kind of languages or insights. 
And at some point, uh, we worked together in this uh, kind of early project, which is a project for the Dutch Parliament. The Dutch Parliament was a kind of uh, medieval kind of fortress uh, with a Gothic church, and somehow a new parliament needed to be uh, conceived. And we interpreted that uh, as a vertical bar, a horizontal bar that went almost like a warfare into the heart of the kind of project. And this was a, a project we developed, to get, developed together. Here you see creating a breach in the center and kind of letting the modern time or the modern articulation of politics enter into the medieval complex. This is Zaha's uh, drawing for the project. Anyway, this uh, was one, this was kind of really, in a certain way, my first uh, kind of professional project because after writing uh, and after being a journalist, writing books, uh, I was by that time almost kind of 36 before I actually started kind of really thinking about architecture. And so it took me a while to really uh, consider myself professional. Uh, of that period, I want to kind of end with a period of trying to learn architecture. I want to end with one particular project, which for me is an important project because it still combines a kind of utopian kind of situation uh, with the practice of architecture. And it dates from a kind of really magical year, uh, the year 1989. I don't know whether that year was magical in Taipei, but in other parts of the world it was very magical because it was the fall of the Berlin Wall and then uh, eventually the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, in other words, there was a moment of euphoria that the Cold War would soon be over and that kind of mankind could live happily ever after. It was also, and, and, and this is, uh, I think, interesting, it also a year that for the first time the digital became a kind of presence in architecture and that, and particularly in the case of making a library, uh, the digital seemed even then to be the enemy of books or the digital scene to make books redundant. And so therefore, if you wanted to make a significant uh, statement, you needed to think about the relationship between books and the digital, and maybe to think of uh, books as forms of inter uh, information that would have to coexist with digital information. So, and this project, uh, as I said, from 89, was our first attempt to really think about that uh, carefully. Um, and this is the sketch, and, and in a certain way, I, I included this one deliberately to show that uh, interesting architectural ideas can emerge from stupid architectural sketches, uh, uh, as long as the definition of it is co correct. What we imagined uh, in this sketch is that uh, as, as you see now in data farms or uh, electronic storage space, that basically we would think of a mass, solid mass of information, whether it was books or digital kind of storage, and that the spaces for the individual libraries would not be formed or would not be built, but would simply be eliminated kind of from this mass of, this dense mass of information. So it's as if you have uh, 10 uh, digital uh, farms, uh, storage farms uh, on top of each other and that you then create the spaces for needed for human beings uh, as voids out of that. Here you see kind of early computer rendering also from uh, 89 uh, where you see this kind of solid block and then we conceived of the kind of shapes or the libraries that were necessary for to realize the program, kind of research library, uh, uh, cinemas, etc., as voids excavated from this plane. And here you see that kind of basically um, the scheme is based on technical scenarios developed with inventors, systems analysts, writer, electronics company. They all anticipate a utopia of fully integrated information systems to materialize before the opening of the building. Books, films, music, computers will be read on the same magic tablets. The future will not spend, uh, spell the end of the book, but a period of new equalities. 
I want to emphasize this word tablets. You know, here you know, our office was anticipating the, the identity or, or the use of tablets, I think two decades almost before they were uh, invented. And uh, I'm not saying that with a kind of form of art, but, but simply to show that uh, the relationship between architecture and the digital and how the digital would change architecture was already very long on the agenda and plays a very big role in any of our work. So here you see two models that we can make the appearance of the building uh, here and then uh, all the void spaces can be presented as solids. From this period, uh, two years later, I show one more kind of project uh, which suggests to what extent uh, time and particular periods in either politics or the history of the world can have a very inspiring effect on architecture and a very direct uh, effect on architecture is that one city, Paris, in two years triggered in a certain way kind of two of our then most important projects and projects where we really could imagine breakthroughs and I think that that uh, is very important uh, to emphasize uh, I do not believe that currently we necessarily believe in a kind of similar period where breakthroughs are possible. In other words, breakthroughs are partly, of course, the result of the creativity of an architect or architects, uh, but not alone. You, you need a collaboration between the time and the author. Um, and and, and basically that collaboration is constantly different, different and that collaboration is constantly kind of leading to kind of results for which yes the architect is responsible but not totally responsible there is also the effect of the time. In this case uh, we needed to uh, create a library in a kind of academic complex uh, a very grim and highly organized, uh, f almost factory of learning in Paris also. This is Jean Nouvel's uh, Institut du Monde Arabe. And basically what we did, we uh, interpreted the library as a continuation of the kind of public space uh, that defined the campus, uh, folded it, folded it uh, kind of more, started to cut, uh, and then created uh, this building. So what we had is a kind of series of folded concrete planes that were supported by uh, a kind of regular grid and from which you could always kind of move without taking any elevator or taking staircases from one level to another. So the invention of this kind of project was to really uh, do away with the whole notion of um, a, s a story or a particular floor, but simply to create a, a single continuity that was interpreted more like uh, urban space than as architectural space. Uh, because urban space uh, allows almost anything and architectural space limits almost anything. And so for that reason, uh, we were uh, interested in finding ways of being urban even as architect. This is kind of finally a section through that kind of point of continuity uh, where you see that it's kind of really a single boulevard that kind of runs uh, through the building kind of rather than a series of individual kind of cuts near that uh, building again. So this is, I would say, kind of the early period uh, that led to a kind of uh, publication of a book, small, medium, large, extra large. Um, so now the next. Basically, by uh, the middle of the 90s, it was clear that the utopia of an, uh, uh, the uh, happy period uh, post-war uh, and happy period where all of us would become the same, uh, we would uh, generate together a kind of single political system based on neoliberal principles, that that was not going to happen. Uh, I felt that uh, my knowledge uh, of the world at the time was too little and that I needed to kind of really f uh, learn and that uh, in order to be able to operate in different kind of systems uh, this learning uh, was becoming a priority and what I also thought and, and noticed is that 
you know, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a lot of architects had written kind of manifestos, uh, but that at the moment that kind of both Europe and America uh, had basically their real development behind them, and Asia was kind of really starting an incredible steep uh, effort at modernization, that uh, the Europeans uh, and the Americans had become kind of silent and were not producing uh, manifestos anymore. Uh, and so I felt that it b became important and crucial to begin to really think about the city and not only simply as a practicing architect, but also as an architect who, with a mission, uh, an architect with a mission perhaps as an intellectual. In the mid 90s, this was still the universal system of uh, uh, the city or the universal identity of the city which by most architects was kind of imposed and presented as the ideal situation. But we had seen that New York actually was already a kind of radically different situation. And if you really looked around uh, carefully, uh, you would notice that in city, in, in China, there were new cities emerging uh, almost overnight. And that kind of, for instance, where Paris had been planned, of course, and had a really a core, here in the core, this was the most um, central, let's say, most metropolitan uh, intersection of Shenzhen, but it, it was uh, less than 400 meters away from a rice field. So we were seeing totally new kinds of city, uh, and somehow the architecture profession had not, never taken the trouble to really think about the difference. And if you looked uh, even more carefully, uh, you saw that in Africa, uh, enormous uh, cities were emerging, sometimes 20 million people, uh, that uh, almost had no urban identity uh, and that in many ways looked like a dump. Uh, but it was a dump that still functioned as a city. So uh, I felt it was important that the profession uh, become uh, aware of it, not only, but also tries to describe it and therefore adjust the model of the city uh, toward a new reality. And that is where uh, I became a teacher in Harvard, uh, but a teacher in a, uh, we run the project uh, on the city, but I became a teacher, and Nancy Lim here can uh, testify to it, not uh, on the model that we would uh, bring in our knowledge and distribute it to the students, but where I declared my ignorance and with the students would uh, able to generate knowledge about these new and unknown situations. Uh, for instance, in the Harvard Guide to Shopping, we looked uh, at uh, worldwide at the amount of square meters of shopping that every citizen had to carry and support. Uh, of course, in America, an enormous number uh, here, uh, kind of slightly less. And in the case of uh, China, we made uh, an effort to understand the urbanization of uh, China, not as a kind of westernization, but clearly as a modernization uh, inspired by and organized by the Communist Party that had basically suggested uh, in 78 that to get rich was glorious. So we looked at the kind of Pearl River Delta uh, at the different uh, conditions there, uh, looked at the incredible investment in infrastructure and at the amazing ability of the communist system to make predictions. Uh, this was in a certain way a prediction because it was a highway system before there were many uh, cities. Uh, and this is one of those examples where uh, at least 10 years before any development, there was an entire infrastructure kind of suggesting but not actually realizing at the time that development uh, and the scale it eventually took. But nine years later or ten years later, there was in fact uh, an entirely new city uh, with a park and a golf course at its center. Uh, one of the um, important and, and exciting things we were able to do, we looked at the density of architects in the different cultures. Enormous amount of architects in uh, England, uh, uh, France and Spain have about as many in the USA, uh, very few per thousand people in China. And then we looked 
had to build. Yeah? Uh, uh, the average uh, uh, construction of the English architect uh, negligible uh, of France and Spain uh, also negligible. America fair, but but of course uh, enormously impressive in in China. And this was for me uh, a kind of very strong sign to declare the Asian architect the architect of the future, and to also look at architecture uh, at Asian architecture as the architecture that needed to give us the kind of impulses and that needed to uh, reinvent and renovate the, the profession of architecture simply through urgency. Because I think that urgency is maybe one of the most important drivers of architecture, uh, architectural events. I, I have to admit that I haven't seen it yet, uh, but uh, in the absence of that, we also uh, published, for those of you who know, a kind of book on the metabolist architects in Japan, because they very, very clearly, in, since the 50s and 60s, gave uh, the world an entirely new architecture. Uh, what is new about uh, Chinese architecture is, of course, the speed in which it is generated, uh, but also the method in which it is generated maybe not the laborious and old-fashioned way of producing architecture, but more an architecture to Photoshop. And Photoshop is basically the medium that uh, combines uh, everything that you find attractive uh, in a single picture. And maybe this is all only to be understood as a kind of architecture by Photoshop. We also uh, felt it was important to actually define what is going on and to give it a name. Uh, we were not necessarily interested in new names, but we uh, redefined a number of uh, concepts. But also here, what we thought, uh, what we called cities of exacerbated difference, we looked at the Pearl River Delta as a system of different cities that each define themselves in relationship to the other. So if one changes, the other has to change as well uh, in order to kind of retain its competitive advantage. So teaching in Harvard was one of the ways in learning. The second one was to uh, enter in our own office uh, a second uh, element, uh, which we called the mirror image uh, AMO. Our office is called OMA, mirror image is called AMO. That was basically a research center or a think tank that could do the kind of diff uh, difficult thing where here we were old fashioned architects and here we were thinking about what architecture will do in the future or can do in the future. Uh, and so initially with um, uh, AMO we did, we thought about shopping and there was a very close relationship between the thinking or the discoveries in Harvard and our own work, uh, so it was very productive. Uh, we did not only do physical things, but we also worked on the branding of, of uh, uh, different companies. So here Prada, instead of being uh, indignant uh, with all the rip-offs, we, we kind of suggested that Prada could be proud of being the most ripped of uh, kind of brand. We also worked for Wired uh, after the internet uh, bubble uh, burst and looked at uh, whether it was possible in a matrix to create new magazines. For instance, between fashion and golf, we uh, introduced a new magazine and we also introduced a new magazine between Vogue and teenagers. So uh, in, in a way we considered this uh, planning or uh, work which needed a kind of architectural thinking but which didn't lead uh, directly to architecture. We also were very much concerned with Europe uh, already more than 15 years trying to make the whole uh, identity of Europe more appealing, particularly to younger generations. Europe has been uh, old, always a kind of old man's uh, dream, and I think that that is why it is uh, currently so vulnerable. So kind of rather than becoming a single blue uh, situation, we propose that actually uh, Europe could be proud of being so incredibly diverse and, and having uh, so many uh, different cultures, uh, b being such a patchwork. Uh, so rather than one identity, to multiply the identities uh, in, in infinitely. Europe has a kind of boring flag. Uh, what we propose is that we would uh, start with Iceland and then kind of move uh, to East and that anyone who is part of Europe would be part of the flag. So uh, that, that was also kind of clearly you know, a, a way of being more youthful. 
than kind of this situation and therefore opening communication. This worked very well. Uh, it was even used to, in, in political kind of circles. Then, uh, of course, 9-11 um, uh, happened and that was for our office, or for me, myself, uh, more than the office, uh, kind of really uh, reason to go move into the next phase um, and kind of suggest that America would be in, in the future more or less its own separate identity and that it became important to concentrate maybe on the most classical form of Europe, Europe uh, and Asia together as a kind of single landmass and, and Africa uh, as part of it. And uh, if you looked at the different political systems that are operative in kind of any of these countries, you realize that uh, far from becoming kind of homogeneous, uh, if you wanted to operate in, this par in these parts of the world, you needed to be able to adjust and to, uh, to communicate with uh, an Im almost infinite amount of different political systems. And then uh, we then considered it that both our work and our uh, work as an intellectual uh, was dedicated to this kind of form of communication. So for us, uh, working in uh, different countries is not a form of imperialism uh, or of uh, Western, importing Western values, but it is really in a very important way an engagement with, hopefully, and uh, an, uh, an, an, an intensification, perhaps, of what uh, these countries, the individual countries, can, can produce. Uh, so each of these words and each of these domains we thought were important, and so we participated in a large scale uh, in a kind of process of communication, and in a certain way, our work for CCTV has to be understood in that uh, manner. Uh, here, uh, we were in 2002, we had two opportunities. One, to be involved in the reconstruction of uh, the World Trade Center. The other one, of uh, being involved in the construction of CCTV. And to uh, many people's shock, we chose for China, uh, a decision very much criticized uh, in, uh, in Europe. The situation there was that there was a, going to be a new CBD in Beijing. Uh, it was going to contain 400 different skyscrapers. So one thing that we thought is that we should not make a kind of simply a vertical element because it would not register, but that we needed to uh, introduce perhaps a more complex form uh, that uh, includes three axes and a loop. So that explains the form. Basically, it's a podium of uh, studios a tower for broadcasting, a tower for creative activity, and a tower for management, and most importantly, a kind of single loop that connects uh, all these elements and that is or will be or might become eventually kind of public. This was the shape, uh, clearly kind of uh, a sculpture uh, on one hand, but sculpture that needed to be built, and this is uh, Arab's analysis of how the different parts of the kind of uh, uh, outside needed to perform, what kind of stresses were uh, there in, in the structure. We used this to uh, intensify the structure where there was great stress, but to eliminate the structure where there wasn't. So uh, this then became the structure for this degree. On the one hand, strictly rational and logical, but in terms of its overall effect, uh, a kind of artistic uh, and seemingly kind of random shape. Uh, it was built, uh, of course, 500,000 square meters of it, uh, an enormous, uh, almost uh, atavistic uh, experience. But at the same time, it was the kind of first building where time played a role because the two halves could not only be coupled uh, at six o'clock in the morning when the two uh, halves had cooled sufficiently to have a similar uh, extension coefficient. Um, CCTV is a kind of very uh, uh, controversial project, not only in the West, of course, but also in China. Um, and uh, one of the heartening kind of moments uh, for me was when we found a poem kind of on one of the kind of columns, 
uh, written by uh, one of the workers that kind of suggested uh, that maybe no, they, they were actually kind of proud and, and, and happy to have produced uh, a project like this kind of rather than uh, as uh, many stories have it, uh, victims also of uh, the regime. Um, I think that CCTV is a, a, a building that really breaks new ground. Um, perhaps one of the most uh, least recognized is how it is, yes it is architecture, but it's also kind of really a structure and the coexistence of architecture and structure, structure in, in the single build, building has never been, I think, so intensely represented as in this uh, building. So here you uh, sense the structure but not quite see it. Here you see that kind of basically many spaces are kind of have certain interventions, uh, almost art-like, uh, of the structure that really characterizes the different uh, conditions. Here's the kind of point where the overhang meets, where there's a glass window. Um, CCTV is uh, controversial, but I think that one of the qualities of this kind of irregular form is for me very important that it uh, associates and connects itself almost effortlessly with uh, other uh, uh, structures around it, whether they're impressive or not. Uh, and so for me, it is not this which is uh, CCTV, but it's kind of basically the way CCTV engages kind of any context. And I think also very important in a system which is dedicated to kind of permanence and stability, uh, the way in which the building doesn't look uh, remotely the same from any different point, and actually uh, creates uh, perhaps the most unstable identity that any architecture has ever uh, uh, conveyed uh, in a system. Here you see how even in a kind of poor Tong neighborhood there's still uh, an affinity or a relationship. I would say here on the skyline again uh, a degree of Chinese ness. Um, it's it, it's a very difficult uh, kind of building, obviously to have done, but uh, to do, but also to have done in the sense that uh, with the current leader or, uh, with the current leader of China, uh, we are in, in a kind of situation of a sandwich, and kind of uh, unpopular in the West and unpopular in China too. So we are trying to make the best out of that. Uh, so this is the, let's say, representative of the middle uh, period, now the last period. I think that contrary to what we thought in 89, that the world was going to be uh, unified in, in a certain way and that political systems were converging, I think that all that we share is the market economy uh, and the market economy, I think, has really drastically influenced all our cultures uh, in a way which uh, I find occasionally kind of very sad. And I try to uh, basically represent it in two images. This is an image of an American soldier uh, in the 40s, and you see that he's in an urban environment, and you see that it is night. And basically, you can expect uh, that whatever happens in the night, it will be exciting, potentially dangerous, uh, potentially not exactly respectable, but at least an intense experience of uh, urban civilization. I think that our current generation is more like this, uh, facing a safe uh, environment, uh, uh, a very innocent environment, uh, and, and probably uh, taking very few risks. And I think that uh, in terms of how I started with a kind of so-called revolution in Paris, when we were all really believing in freedom, uh, e um, equality and brotherhood, that we are now more in a kind of situation of uh, believing in comfort, security and sustainability. And so we've really made, you know, in, in these 40 years, a kind of fair, fairly drastic situation that uh, uh, has also as a kind of counterpart uh, the invented the uh, role of the uh, star architect uh, 
uh, star, uh, I would say, is uh, intimately connected to the market economy, where uh, a small group of people is basically identified uh, as such, and therefore uh, has a kind of uh, fairly uh, difficult uh, situation in terms of actually creating authentic architecture. I think that architecture itself in the last 40 years or 30 years has changed from this condition where anyone who looks at it knows that this is the articulation of values of a, uh, a particular society that is kind of probably an attempt to articulate the best values and the most shared values and that this is the kind of current uh, architecture uh, it's not no longer shared values it's not necessarily also the best values it's basically an architecture which is generated between a private client and an architect and i'm not saying i love this building but it is a radical difference and what it means is that the architect has the star architect particularly has been separated from serious efforts such as this one where basically you know you do kind of social housing and and none of us uh, of the usual suspects would be in this situation again i think architecture from uh, uh, this is my hero miss van der Rohe, smoking a cigar in an abstract uh, environment uh, al uh, alone and and basically thinking and this is the current star architect who uh, is basically having to sell, uh, having to kind of perform, and, uh, and, and almost never uh, alone anymore. <laughs> and this is the kind of work we produce together. Uh, and uh, I, I think there is a kind of really serious issue with that, because maybe individually you know, our work is serious and, and interesting, but collectively uh, I I think it's highly problematic. So in order, uh, then again, and I'm simply showing constantly the kind of uh, interaction between the general situation and how we can respond uh, in the work, uh, then it became important again to look at architecture, what it is. Uh, I did uh, Venice Biennale called Fundamentals, where uh, I tried to unwind this whole history that had uh, led to, in my view, a kind of fairly sterile uh, conclusion and, and looked at the entire history of architecture, but not uh, through buildings, but simply through elements. So it is called elements of architecture, and we looked literally uh, at simple elements shared by every culture, every civilization, and every period, like the floor, the wall, the ceiling, the window, the door. And uh, in Venice, we basically, uh, had a kind of single element in each of these uh, kind of rooms and uh, a book which actually will appear uh, early next year where we try to uh, create and, and, and tell all these histories. This was the entrance situation. Uh, it was the ceiling uh, and what you see here uh, is that the ceiling used to be a kind of plane on which kind of values and uh, cultural narratives could be kind of projected uh, either religious or metaphorical and now it is a kind of technical domain uh, which uh, creates uh, at best a kind of neutral plane uh, and and of course basically western rationalism has eliminated uh, almost globally an enormous amount and literally swept away an enormous amount of possible articulations of what architecture could do an important part of the uh, project was to resurrect and investigate histories uh, that had gone before. So we translated the kind of Chinese book about uh, making of roofs or making of architecture and translated it in models, translated it literally but also in models and discovered that what kind of to some extent looks like a lack of imagination in the sense that every Chinese roof had to conform to the same principles was in the end uh, perhaps a very smart way of looking at corruption because it meant that the same solution would cost the same everywhere uh, or other kind of very recognizable kind of elements of the current moment. Uh, but what we discovered uh, to, our, uh, uh, to our shock in a certain way is that many of the elements in here are kind of returned to the digital that many of the architectural elements that we 
thought were kind of rather stable were at this point already infiltrated by digital technology. Uh, here you see a floor that kind of records uh, the movement of a person and that kind of when a person lies down on it, uh, it could uh, alert almost directly the hospital if you have a heart attack. Um, and basically what, it, what that meant is that kind of basically the architecture elements that had never communicated were kind of suddenly turning into devices that uh, not were not only kind of recording events in the house but also conveying and communicating those to people elsewhere. So a house used to be mute uh, but now a house communicates and, and I thought that could be uh, potentially dangerous because very soon a house can betray you. Uh, he, here you see the toilet. The toilet is also equipped with a device that analyzes every event and uh, alerts you to uh, imminent or uh, uh, problems. This was kind of basically a thermostat uh, that uh, after a while began to know you as, uh, and your preferences, anticipate your preferences, but also communicating your preferences to the uh, 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 electricity uh, supplier so that they would never be um, surprised uh, and uh, therefore what I kind of really feel is that uh, not only uh, is uh, contemporary culture eliminating uh, earlier cultures we know that from modernization kind of probably in return for a better performance or greater security or greater efficiency, but we also are constantly bombarded now with so-called improvements uh, that actually have a commercial interest. So I think that what is beginning to bother me kind of very seriously is not only at the scale of architectural elements, uh, but also at the scale of the city, which is of course the next level. Uh, commercial uh, uh, interests are seemingly kind of responsible for transforming our cities into a radically different condition than we knew. Because this is the intersection of the future and you see that kind of basically everything is equipped with sensors, every lantern, every traffic light and, and basically again uh, we are s seeing that the city is turning from a, a system that is essentially unpredictable and that has as its great attraction the fact that it uh, uh, offers adventure and surprise is turning into a kind of system that less and less uh, offers uncertainty uh, and unpredictability. Uh, we are on our way to become kind of utterly predictable and, and seemingly kind of surrendering to that situation uh, almost without any hesitation. So as part of my response again to that situation, we are now looking at the countryside because uh, one uh, thing uh, is that kind of uh, since more than half of mankind now lives in cities for the last 10 years that statistic is kind of repeated and repeated we are becoming solely and exclusively focused on the city and ignoring the countryside even though only 2% of the <coughs> surface of the earth is city uh, and 98% uh, is countryside we are, so we are now uh, after our intense relationship and intense involvement in defining what cities are today, we are now looking at the countryside with a kind of equal intense involvement to understand what the countryside is and what, uh, how the countryside is changing. For me, this is a beautiful picture. Uh, a century ago, uh, people knowing their place, being involved in kind of rituals, folklore as a kind of uh, uh, coherent system, uh, values being communicated, uh, a kind of frugality also, and here now three Thai uh, 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 women in Switzerland who are kind of supposed to look after the empty houses, the uh, pets and the kids uh, of uh, uh, affluent Western kind of civilization. We also see that kind of enormous sections of the countryside are in organized uh, in a, a ruthless Cartesian way uh, to maintain the kind of pleasures of the city. 
uh, and maybe there is a kind of uh, reason to suspect that actually compared to the city, the countryside is changing much more. And so there's evidence of that in Nevada. Silicon Valley is here to the left. Nevada, you don't have to pay taxes. So the infrastructure of Silicon Valley is becoming increasingly planned in an enormous industrial center, bigger than the city of Reno, where larger and larger kind of factories are built and constructed. Uh, Tesla is only kind of one of them. But these elements are really un uh, incredible unimaginably long. Like some of them are a, a, a kilometer and a half, other buildings are two kilometer long. So that is a scale of architecture which has never kind of really existed before, but it's also a scale of architecture never uh, before has been as abstract, because more and more work is aut automa automated in these uh, factories. So the factories are bigger and bigger, but inhabited by fewer and fewer human beings and so for that reason it's kind of necessary to begin to think what such a situation can be called because it has the scale of a city but it will be inhabited maybe by 400 people so do you still call this kind of public space or is it something else or do we have to kind of prepare for a kind of post-human architecture where we have structures the structures perform certain necessary tasks in a certain way, uh, but and we have to design and build them, but they should no longer be measured by any of the uh, conventions of human use. And maybe you see here uh, what the consequence can be in the sense that uh, the extreme color is simply a color coding uh, uh, that, that does not imply the presence of human beings. So I now want to, uh, one minute before I should finish, um, uh, talk about Taipei. Because Taipei is for me a kind of building uh, that is trying to anticipate, again, future uh, uh, conditions of architecture and, and also what a future architecture could look like. Uh, Taipei is, of course, at first sight, the absolute opposite of this kind of post-human architecture. This is, uh, was on the side. And on the side, they were cooking with a kind of pan that became uh, very much the, kind of, uh, the trigger for the entire project. This is the typical cultural center of today, an auditorium with a stage, an auditorium with a second stage uh, concert hall. Uh, and none of these is in any way connected. And what we uh, uh, thought and what is the key of the Taipei project is that uh, a central uh, tower or condition connects all the technical spaces uh, of the entire building and that the auditoriums then can cantilever on three sides uh, away from that central thing. So for me, this condition is perhaps uh, the closest we have become uh, ever come to try to define a kind of new architecture in, in a way that it, the, most of the building is a machine. Uh, and, of course, in that machine there are pockets of human uh, presence, uh, i.e. the auditoriums, and of course they are welcome, and of course we do everything to make them feel good, but the main focus on the building is how to perform, how can all these spaces perform, and here you see a kind of single kind of section, uh, an incredibly <coughs> intricate theoretical machinery, uh, that is not only serving a single auditorium, but that in the kind of extended version can be a coupling or a connection between all the auditoriums to create kind of radically new situation uh, in the theater. So here again, uh, what we're trying to explore is if architecture abandons its kind of humanistic uh, assumptions, i.e. the auditorium is the key, the stage tower is something else, but if we kind of really look at the kind of technology first and then how it can be used and then how people can witness it, uh, it seems uh, another way of exploring architecture which I think is more and will be more characteristic of the 21st century. Thank you.
I, I deliberately kind of divided this uh, lecture in kind of three di uh, different kind of parts and periods. Uh, because later in 10 minutes, I think there will be a, a small symposium with three partners uh, that each are looking at any of these uh, conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 